Awesome. Thanks, Christina. And thanks, everyone, for joining me to, to, today and this morning or this evening or wherever you are. And um, I hope this is a, an interesting topic for some of you. But today, I'm going to be talking about uh, building and maintaining your own secure container OS. And the, <clears throat> the example that we're going to use is, is Bottle Rocket OS. Um, and to, to kind of dive right in, I want to give a bit of an explanation as to, to what Bottle Rocket is. Um, so I'll talk about that first. Um, and essentially, Bottle Rocket is a minimal and secure Linux operating system that's been purpose built from the ground up for running containers. Um, it's secure by design and follows some of the best practices for container security. So it only includes the tools that are needed to run containers and significantly reduces the attack surface and impact for vulnerabilities. Um, and by virtue of being minimal, uh, nodes running Bottle Rocket have uh, essentially a fast boot time and, and are thus able to enable clusters to scale uh, quickly and varying traffic patterns or workloads as, as those change. So in conjunction um, with an orchestrator, Bottle Rocket enables various update strategies um, to new versions of the software with little to no operational overhead. Um, node level updates are essentially handled in an atomic manner and provide um, uh, safe and um, safety and visibility in, throughout the entire update process. Um, and customers can always have essentially the latest and greatest version of the OS running on their hosts with, with minimal effort. Um, and I'm going to dive into to some of these a, a little bit um, after this. So I'm going to breeze through these a little bit more. Um, but separately, Bottle Rocket also provides a suite of tools that help users build a custom community supported variant of the operating system directly from the source on GitHub. And that's going to be the bulk of what we're going to talk about today. Um, but before we really kind of dive into that, I want to touch on some of these first. And so one of the first areas that we want to talk about with Bottle Rocket is security. Um, out, of the, out of the gates, um, and actually we've got a question that I, I, Jose, I will get to your question in a little bit. Um, it is a good question and, and we'll talk to that to probably a little, little, little length. Um, but the idea is we wanted to build a secure operating system um, straight out of the gates. Everything that we build at AWS is essentially security first. And so we wanted to build an operating system that, that, that focused on that as well. And so we built it with SC Linux in an um, enabled and an enforcing mode by default. So the, the, the goal of the SC Linux policy here is to, to really separate the containers that are gonna be running on that particular host from the un underlying operating system itself. And if you have scenarios where you need to elevate permissions um, and uh, gain additional permissions for the workloads that are run that, running on that, we want to provide the flexibility to be able to do that. So there are ways to elevate your permissions. Um, but by default, we want to make sure that we're separating those workloads as, as much as possible um, for safety and security concerns. Um, in addition to that, we have treated the operating system much like we treat the workloads that are running on it. So typically, when you're building a container workload, you want them to be read-only. So the, the the file system for Bottle Rocket is largely read only. Um, it's it's using something like uh, something called DM Verity, which allows us to check a hash on every block that is written on the the, the disk. Um, and if any changes are actually made to the the disk or to the file system, um, those are detected on read, and the I/O operation is actually blocked. And so. What this allows you to do is detect if it is any changes that have occurred on your system and flag that system um, for being able to be um, quarantined um, and you know have a security team basically uh, do a root cause analysis on it. Um, but we understand that you know as a as an operating system, we actually do need some ability to write. Um, configuration. So um, a folder like Etsy, for example, which is where um, the system holds all the configuration for the applications that are running on the on the, the, the operating system, um, we need to be able to make that writable, but leaving it writable is essentially a risk. And so what we've done is we've made it um, essentially a stateless file system um, that is empty at boot. And we use a number of various helper programs to populate it with necessary components when you actually build your image um, and, and when you boot it up. So um, essentially it starts blank and populates with the things that you need to be able to run successfully. Um, and this, these kind of these three things really do help make sure that changes can't be made on the system itself. Um, and if they are made, you can detect them pretty quickly. So it's this security first kind of mindset really is pervasive throughout the OS. Um, in addition to that, we don't include any shells or interpreters. So there's no way for you to actually log into the underlying host OS directly 
we have mechanisms for that that I'll talk about in a, in a moment. Um, but for the most part, everything is 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 walled off, and even things like the the binaries that that we've we've included within it, um, those are built with hardened flags to ensure that they can't be leveraged or abused um, as best as possible. We also wanted the operating system to be flexible. So we understand there's multiple orchestration um, orchestrators for, for containers, there's multiple cloud environments. Um, we wanted to be able to build an operating system that could support that. So um, we allow for these things, these, these different builds, and we refer to them as, as variants. So every variant of Bottle Rocket is essentially a combination of software uh, settings and disk layouts that are then used to build an actual image of the OS. And so um, I think the easiest way to think of Bottle Rocket in this kind of context is that Bottle Rocket is essentially a container host OS builder. So you provide your spec, you provide your settings, and then you actually use the Bottle Rocket SDK to actually build the finalized um, OS that you're going to use. Um, or you can leverage one that say like we provide through AWS for running on AWS. Um, in addition to, like I said, like we've got security, we've got the flexibility. What we also wanted to do is make sure that updates um, were, were easy and, and uh, far more simplified than what you would get with something like a general purpose OS. Um, and so for this, we're using the update framework. Um, and this allows us to create secure repositories for updates so that if a bottle rocket host needs to download a new version, um, it can do so in a way that we can ensure there aren't um, uh, or there's minimized opportunities for uh, security concerns in between, like say during a pull of, of, of a particular um, update version, um, we, we verify uh, crypto, cryptographic keys and make sure that you're pulling from the right location. Um, the, the updates themselves are handled in an atomic way. So rather than like a general purpose OS where um, you might have one package that has an update and then that has 50 dependencies downstream from it that also have updates. And before you know it, you know, a simple update process is you're validating thousands of packages. Um, the, the way this works is it actually downloads a full image of the, the, the updated OS to another partition on the, the host itself. And so you imagine you have your, your partition that's running the operating system, and then you've got a secondary partition. It'll actually stage a new version of the OS on that secondary partition. And we use a tool called Updog that actually handles swapping of the priority of those partitions. We'll go through and validate that, that the, the download is complete, and it'll actually handle um, the reboot and any potential, uh, potential failures that might occur during a reboot. So if it detects that there's an issue, it'll automatically roll back to the previous um, partition, and you're good to go. Um, and so we've got a couple of questions. So we've already talked about a little bit about variants, um, and we've got another question here. So the first question is, you know, is Bottle Rocket available out to run outside of AWS? Um, today it is not, but that is the long-term goal. So we want to be able to um, give you the flexibility to produce um, uh, variants that will run on bare metal, that will run on other clouds, that will run on-prem. Um, what we've started with, because we're producing this, we've started with our two orchestrators first. So we've got EKS and ECS that we support today. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more, um, but the long-term goal is to support variants and build variants that can run in uh, wherever your containers are running. So that's kind of the, the long-term goal. And then the second question we have is, why would we need Bottle Rocket if we already have Linux operating systems with container Docker engines installed on them? Um, and that's what I'm going to dive into a little bit right here. Um, and so because we've stripped everything out of the operating system, this only includes the things that are necessary to run containers. So basically, there's no additional binaries and libraries. There's no package management solution. There's nothing installed on that OS outside of what the specific configuration for that variant is, and essentially Docker or Container D. And so um, with our, our the way we've provisioned our variants for EKS and ECS is there's essentially two container runtimes on that host. So there's the runtime for the scheduled workloads. So those that your orchestrators are going to be uh, placing tasks or, or scheduling pods on. Um, and then we have essentially another, another runtime that is uh, se separate from that, that runs the administration tasks on the host itself. So by doing this, we're providing a far more secure environment for running your containers that is far more lightweight 
Um, it comes with security option, um, um, because security configuration out of the box without you having to necessarily do anything additional. What you would typically have to do is in what we would call undifferentiated heavy lifting if you were using a more general purpose OS. And so what this does is it gives you these degrees and a foundation of security to start um, for your container workloads on day one with versus having to figure this out and kind of grow it on your own organically. Um, and so it gives you a lot of benefit there. Um, but the idea is um, we, we've built this to be flexible, secure, and, and allow for you to have some access to um, the underlying host for things like development, debugging, troubleshooting. Um, on the host itself, like I said, we've got the, the, the runtime specifically for your workloads, and we've got what we call host containers, and there's a runtime of container D or Docker um, specifically for uh, the, the host containers. And we have two that we basically provide, but you can add additional ones, and I'll go into this uh, later in the talk. Um, but we have one that's a control container that's on by default, and this essentially exposes an API, which is how you interact with the underlying host itself. So you can make updates to configuration through the API. You can add additional host containers through the API. You can check settings and modify settings through that. If you want to make any modifications to that underlying host, you can use the API to add uh, what we call an admin container. This is off by default, but basically when you activate it, it'll go and download a container to that secondary um, container runtime that has additional permissions. And this will allow you to get a shell prompt. It will allow you to get um, um, much more deeper hooks into the underlying OS of the host. Um, and this should be used for something like deep de debugging or exploration during build processes, but it should be used um, essentially sparingly. And so is it possible to run on a Raspberry Pi 4? Not today, but um, we will get into the fact that we can uh, cross compile to ARM uh, 64. Um, and so if you wanted to build a variant that could run on a Raspberry Pi, that is something that, that, that the community can totally do. Um, it's just a matter of writing the config for that and going through and, and, and building the image. And this, we'll kind of dive into that question right now um, as we go over some of the build concepts. Um, some of the high-level build concepts. So as you start to, to, to try and build your disk image for, um, for Bottle Rocket, you're going to need a few things. And so the, the components look like this. You've essentially got a build machine that you're going to use to do your builds. Um, on that machine, you're going to have some um, required tooling. So everything that we've built, we've built uh, that's first party. Um, um, we're using Rust and Cargo to, to kind of use uh, handle our packages and, and build process. Um, we'll use Docker um, to, to actually do the build itself. Um, so the SDK is essentially a Docker image. We're using RPM, but we're not using it in the sense that we have um, RPM images that we're, we're installing through a package manager. We're using it as more of like the, the package spec. Um, and I'll talk to that a little bit. And then there's Linux build tools. And so on that machine, you're going to basically suck in the bottle rocket source code from our, our Git repository. And then um, this will also download the SDK. And then if there's any particular dependencies or packages that your, your variant that you want to build needs, it's going to download those as well to that build machine. Um, as you go through the build process, it will produce a couple of different outputs, or there's some options for different outputs. So the primary output is going to be a bottle rocket disk image. Um, and then there's some optional outputs that you can, um, you can create along with that. So a bottle rocket repository. So if you create, say, your own variant of bottle rocket and you want to be able to create an update repository, you can create that and that will publish um, out to wherever you want it to be. So this can be you know, for, for the bottle rocket variants that we manage. Uh, at AWS, um, these will be published to an S3 bucket um, with a CloudFront distribution in front of it. Um, the key point here is you, you need it to be accessible to the hosts so that they can check for updates regularly. Um, and if there is an update, they can download it to that, that secondary partition. Um, and yeah, a third option here for an output is uh, essentially an AMI or a disk image for um, Amazon machine images. Um, and so this is you know, what we use at AWS to be able to run these on the, the actual hosts themselves. So what it's going to do is it's going to create an AMI, publish that to a particular region. And then when you provision a host, it's going to use that AMI as its disk image. Um, and I've got some questions. Is Bottle Rocket the underlying OS for Fargate? No, it is not. Um, uh, the underlying host for Fargate is uh, essentially a, a lightweight VM running uh, using Firecracker. Um, if you want to look that up, you can look up AWS Firecracker, and there's some, some more details around that. Um, it's Somewhat similar in concept, though, it's it's designed to be very, very, very lightweight, very stripped down, secure, 
Um, but this is um, ours is a little bit more purpose built for the, the the task of just containers. So it's it's a little bit different. Um, and then talking tooling, um, some of the tools that we're going to need to go through and build uh, go through the build process are things like Cargo. So like I said, um, all of our first party tooling is written essentially in Rust. Um, and so we're leveraging the Cargo Package Manager, which is uh, comes along with that. And that's going to handle a lot more than just the, the our packages. We're essentially using it as a dependency solver for our first and third party packages. So it's it's going to handle a lot of the orchestration of the build process on our behalf, and we'll actually invoke other tools to to handle different components um, um, when that portion of the build is is executed. And we'll dive into a little bit more of explanation in a moment. We're also using RPM, um, so. Like I said earlier, we're not installing the RPM package manager on the system itself. We're essentially using the RPM spec files to identify any of the um, necessary packages that you want to include within your variants, its dependencies, its source code. Um, and the idea is that we will download all of that source code locally during the build process. So when you execute a cargo bit, uh, make, it's going to go download all those requirements. It will um, build an RPM based on that. So it's not going to pull from essentially the, the, the typical package manager location. It's going to pull all the source and compile it um, locally on your machine. And then it's going to cache that on that build machine. So in the future, if you run subsequent builds, it will uh, leverage the cache for that. And then it's going to use the bottle rocket SDK, which is essentially um, includes all of the necessary tools that we need to actually um, perform all of the builds um, for the, the tool chain um, and actually uh, produce the output. And this is essentially a Docker uh, image. Um, and then, like I said, we're using Docker um, throughout the whole stack to, to produce the, the, uh, the exported image. And um, there's a question now about whether Bottle Rocket is being used in production. And yes, it is. So we've got a number of, of, of partners and customers that are using it safely in production for EKS. Um, the ECS uh, is in preview right now. So if you wanted to, to, to test that in preview um, for ECS, by all means, I would recommend you, you give that a try. Um, and as soon as that goes to GA, um, I would recommend that for production workloads. But for EKS, uh, customers are using that today. Um, and the, the build process itself is, is pretty straightforward. Um, what you're going to need essentially is a machine that's capable of actually performing the build. Um, and this is probably the most challenging part of this. The, the build process and its artifacts um, can actually run in excess of about 80 gigabytes. And so you want to make sure that depending upon the variant that you're building, that you have enough disk space on that underlying build machine to, to be able to support that, that storage requirement. Um, you know, if you're using like a, an AWS 9 environment, you'll probably want to add additional disk space because I think they start with 20 gigabytes. Um, so you'll, you'll blow through that pretty quickly. Um, but you also want to consider that um, it's pretty resource intensive, but it can, it can scale pretty well through additional cores. And so um, we've got some build environments that, that scale up to 32 plus cores. And the builds for on those systems typically take about 12 minutes. Um, but if you've got like my MacBook that I, I built it on that's got eight cores or, or four cores actually, um, it took about three hours for it to, to go through. So it's, um, it's gonna require um, a couple of libraries and, and tools like I mentioned and some patience. So um, if you trigger a build, uh, I recommend you have some strong coffee and you know, some kind of hobby to help you pass the time. You know, if you wanna get into needlepoint or crochet, maybe look up some Star Wars patterns and have some fun, um, but you're gonna, you're gonna take a little bit. Um, and the way this works is it's pretty straightforward. You're, you're going to start a, a simple cargo command, which will go through and, and it's, it's the similar to make, but we're using cargo to actually handle the make process. So you trigger the builds using that. Um, there's some additional flags that you can specify. So if you want to build a specific variant or say you're managing multiple variants, like I want to build a specific version of the EKS variant, um, you can specify that variant. Um, like I said, we support multi arcs. Um, so if you want to run this on, say, like a Graviton processor on AWS or uh, ARM64 processor, um, you know, you can actually build and compile um, a variant for that. So you can specify the architecture you want to support. And this will actually go and invoke a few things. Um, at the core of, of Cargo is essentially a make file. And this is a TOML file that actually specifies um, 
all of the environment, environmental variables, um, and it starts to list out the tasks and, and build dependencies that you're going to need to actually execute this build. Um, and so it's going to uh, evaluate this, set up um, all those dependencies, set up some specific pathing, and then it'll actually start to go through and build out those dependencies. Um, if the dependencies have been built previously and they're cached, it's going to leverage the cache version. If there was a delta between um, uh, when it was previously cached and what's available today, it will, of course, grab a new version and, and rebuild uh, based on that. And then you can even invalidate that yourself. So if you want to build a fresh copy, there's uh, some arguments we can provide in the command line um, to, to, to make sure it grabs a, new, a fresh version. Um, and so the idea here is it's going to trigger this, and then we're going to actually um, use a feature within each of the project or each of the, the packages in the project itself, um, which is known as build RS. And so this is a Rust script that actually will go through. Um, it's, it's at the base of every uh, package that you have. It's going to be in the same directory as your cargo toml file. Um, and basically what this does is it um, compiles all of the, it'll basically be built and compiled and executed prior to the cargo package, uh, building the cargo package in which the cargo build was invoked. And this gets kind of convoluted, but the, the, the idea is you've got two things that we're gonna build here. So there's the variant, which we, we triggered through our, our cargo make, and then there's packages, which are the dependencies. And so once we've triggered the, the variant build, it's gonna go through and find all the dependencies. is a pretty simple uh, script. And it's going to specify, like I said, two things, either build variant or build, um, I think you can see my mouse over here. So it's going to build variant or build package. And it's going to use a tool called build sys to do that. And this is all this build RS file does. Um, and what this will actually do is it will trigger this build sys application that will go through the bottle rocket tree and it will identify um, uh, all the, 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 the packages that need to be executed and built, it will spin up a Docker build command using the, the, the box. Bottle Rocket SDK, the, the, the SDK, it will then spin up a Docker build for that particular one. It will leverage the SDK to um, then build the RPM package for that, that dependency and it'll copy that desired artifact out of that container onto a local disk in a, in a particular directory um, that will be later used when we actually go to build the variant. And so this seems kind of confusing, but essentially it's gonna go one by one through all those dependencies, build them as an RPM file from source, put the output in a particular directory, and then move on to the next one. And so it will leverage that, that cargo toml file to go through and build each package and identify any additional dependencies that they need. So this can get pretty nested. And so this is why I say it can take uh, quite a bit of time. And so if you have a package that has other dependencies, it's gonna kind of spider through each of those. Um, and each time it needs to do that, it's gonna spin up another uh, build process. It will go through and build that, put it in the output directory. And so for example, we've got our EKS variant here. And so this is gonna be running Kubernetes uh, 1.19. And in order to be able to connect that finished host, so imagine we've gone through the build processes and we have our image. Um, when we spin up that host, there's certain configuration that needs to be on there in order for that host to communicate with the EKS control plane or the Kubernetes uh, masters. And so we have our AWS IAM authenticator. We've got the CNI and CNI plugins so that the networking can connect. We have the specific kernel that we want to build. We have uh, the Kubernetes um, version that we want to, to build and have a part of that. And so by using this combination of these TOML files and our build RS and build sys um, 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 applications, you can actually go through and build this very complex um, set of dependencies and this, this tree of dependencies into a, a meaningful output that can then be leveraged um, by the build to produce our, our disk image. And so once it's gone through those packages and it's built all those dependencies, it's basically gonna then focus on actually building the variant. Um, and what this looks like is it's, is it's a simple Docker build command. 
um, and we've specified specific directories um, that, that it's going to use to basically go through and, and, and build each of these. Um, I need to make sure I'm on time. Okay. Um, and so it's going to take all those RPMs and leverage the RPMs from the, the output directory, the artifact directory that we've created. And it's going to install those as a disk image, which will actually become the root file system for our image. So it's going to basically use RPM to image to create that file system and then make sure everything that needs to be installed for that variant is installed and configured from those packages. Um, and then what it will actually do is it'll output a final disk image to this build or slash build slash images directory. Um, and at that point, you have your actual um, completed image, but it's just a disk image. And so um, you need to be able to put it to use. And so for the sake of something running in AWS, like I said, we want to convert that disk image into an AMI. So we have a cargo make uh, a method that will actually go through and do that. So it'll publish that uh, disk image, convert it to an AMI, uh, get it into a specific region that we specify, and then it'll actually make that uh, public so that the, the hosts themselves can go through and download that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, this is optional, like honestly, um, you know, for, uh, I'll go into this a little bit more and the way that the, these, um, you know, once we've got it published and it's out there, we can go through this update process and we create a, essentially a repository to handle the updates. This portion is, is somewhat optional. So if you want to run in place updates and you want to go through and build out, um, a repository to be able to say, leverage the in place updates along with our update uh, operator, say for Kubernetes that will actually keep these um, hosts uh, up to date, you can publish a, re a repo. And you know we publish the ones for the variants that we manage, but if you want to create your own variant, you can actually publish your own repo. Um, it just requires some simple metadata, um, some um, cryptographic hashes, um, basically some signing keys as well to make sure that when a host wants to connect to that repo, it's doing so in a secure way and it's pulling the, uh, a validated version from the, the repo that you've, you've created. And Cargo will actually go through and make this for you. And then you basically just copy um, those images to that repository wherever you want it to be stored, whether that be S3 or wherever. Um, and that can be, um, it just needs to be exposed in a way that the host can actually reach it. So if it's on an internal network, as long as those hosts can reach it, you should be fine. Um, but the idea here is this is optional. Um, you don't have to do in-place upgrades. You know, one of the beauties of, of Bottle Rocket is the fact that it is an atomic update. So you can do an alternative view where it's instead of um, uh, updating this way, you can just do wholesale image uh, host replacement. So you can spin up uh, a number of new hosts running the, 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 the latest version and just replace all the existing ones. Um, and if you wanted to, to run your operation that way, you could even build a variant that doesn't include that secondary disk partition and doesn't include the update process itself. So I say that this this is optional, but we want to provide a mechanism that if you want to handle updates yourself, you can do so in a secure way that enables the operating system and the host to, 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 to make sure they're running the latest version at all times. But if you want to run this through a different process, there's that flexibility. Um, and there's a couple of questions. I'll get to those um, in a little bit. Um, and the idea is at this point, you basically have everything that you need to run the operating system. Um, but there's ways that you might want to extend that. And so, you know, I show you how to go through and build the, the variants, um, but the idea here is not everything needs to be built into the host OS. In fact, we would, we would actually prefer that you build minimally into the, the OS as possible. And you use one of these extension methods to add features and capabilities as needed. Um, and so one of the obvious ways that you might need um, to extend Bottle Rocket is adding additional permissions. Um, and, you know, like I said at the beginning of this, we have the SE Linux policy in place that defines, you know, how to transition rules for, for container runtimes. And we, we've set that in a very restrictive mode by default, um, but we have three, um, three methods that you can use to um, elevate those permissions. Um, everything by default that's running as a workload on top of um, the, the host is going to be running in a, a, what we call container T. And so this is going to be the default for any ordinary containers. This is going to be essentially a walled garden from the underlying host itself. Um, and then anything that requires additional permit privileges. So if you want to run a container in privilege mode or uh, the control host container, I'll use as an example, um, it's going to be running in control T. And so this gives it uh, elevated privileges. And you kind of need to be careful here, because if you think about this, we've got the control host 
that's running on that instance that provides the API. But because that control host can add additional host containers to that host, there are ways to leverage that control T to get super T access, which is super powered. Essentially, you, you have unlimited access to the underlying host OS. And so you want to make sure that if you're going down this path, you're being very specific about why you're doing it, and you have specific processes to ensure that you're doing this in a safe manner that's not introducing security holes along the way. And so if you have, say, like a, a solution that needs to have tighter access to do um, runtime scanning, um, file access scanning, something like that, um, that requires a little bit more permissions, I would do that in a way that that's cognizant of the fact that um, you need to, to, to look at uh, security in depth, <laughs> defense in depth, and, and make sure you're doing so in a way that's going to maintain that security while providing um, access to this. Um, the way this typically works with something like Kubernetes or ECS um, is in your pod spec or task definition, you can actually specify these in, in, in those files. Um, and this is the way it looks like for a Kubernetes pod spec. So you can come in and, and specify the specific uh, security context um, and the SE Linux options you want. So you can specify the user, the role, uh, the user type, and even the level. Um, and you want to be very careful here because, like I said, what you provide here can actually be used to gain additional access. Um, and if we look at this, um, at providing containers, uh, if you want to look, if you want to dive deeper into to, to how this works, we've got this specific guide here that will go more in depth on what options and guidance we have around uh, providing your, your workloads with additional privileges. Um, I would say, you know, like I said, use this sparingly. And if you want to, to, to have additional features or capabilities, I would, I would target something like a host or a bootstrap container. Um, and then um, we'll, we'll dive into eBPF and other stuff in a moment. But the idea here is you can add additional host containers to um, the host itself. So if you need to have a workload that's running um, that needs tighter access to say you're an ISV partner or a solution provider and you need to have uh, an agent that's running on that system at all times, um, you can add that potentially as a host container. Um, and so you can give that, that host container privileges uh, to be able to run at boot and essentially have access to that, that, that system. Um, these host containers that you have to be uh, mindful of, uh, they're not orchestrated. Um, so uh, they only stop and start according to whether or not uh, a, a, an enabled flag has been specified. Um, and while they aren't um, orchestrated on the host itself, they are managed and monitored. So um, if they do stop, we can start them again. Um, they're essentially run, like I said, in that second instance of container D. So they are in a, a different walled area uh, for the, the OS um, and they're not updated automatically. So imagine this is a container that's gonna be downloaded and run on the host in another container D environment or Docker environment. Um, so if you have updates to your host container, you'll have to go through and disable that, that, that container download the latest version and then enable it. So it's um, there's a, an update process there that's kind of managed separately. Um, and if you set this thing to be super powered, it essentially has unlimited access to the host. So you need to be mindful of that. Um, recently, we added the, the concept of bootstrap containers and these are designed to help bootstrap the host before other services start. Um, and the idea here is that they're um, unlike normal hosts, and they're not treated um, with superpowers, like you can't give it, um, like a, a normal host container, you can't give it a superpowered um, access. Um, they have access to the underlying root file system at slash dot bottle rocket slash root FS. So be mindful of that. Essentially, they start and run after system D configured uh, dot target unit is active. So once that's running, um, these bootstrap containers will be executed and they're not run in a deterministic order. So the boot process will essentially wait for these to, to execute. And if they execute in a non with a non-zero value, they're actually going to stop the, 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 um, the, the boot if uh, we set it as essential. Um, and so this is what it kind of looks like when you want to add a host container. It's a simple API call to the host container, the, the, the control container that's on there. Um, you specify the URL. You specify whether you want it to be enabled. Like I said, you can. This can be be downloaded and not enabled. You can enable it; it, it will. Um, and then you decide whether you want it to be superpowered. Um, and the same with uh, the bootstrap containers as well. So we've got this idea that um, you know you specify the URL. You decide whether it's run once, whether it's run always, whether it's off. 
um, and then um, you decide whether it's essential or not. So if this is essential and we go through and uh, there's an error, it will actually prevent that, that host from, um, from being booted up because something in the provisioning has, has failed. Um, and then if we want to extend um, the capabilities even further, the, this is honestly the, the preferred method. So um, you know, we have this, this way to provide additional access. We have this way to add additional um, containers to that host that can perform things that may not be possible in the OS. So imagine you need to have additional tooling um, rather than installing that in the OS, you can install that in your host container and you can add that there. Um, these should be used is like very sparing, a little less sparing. And this is kind of the, the preferred method here. So um, if you want to extend, I would start with um, looking at kernel modules first. Um, and I would look at this using eBPF first. So we're using a version of, of the, the Linux kernel that supports eBPF out of the box. Um, and so from just the containers that are running in the orchestrated environment. So imagine you're running in Kubernetes um, you have a, an EKS cluster that you've got a number of these bottle rocket hosts in, you can have these run as a daemon set. So you can have a, a daemon set running in that environment that has um, a specific application that has an EB, eBPF connection to the underlying OS um, and is, is written in a way that it's leveraging eBPF to handle any communications with the underlying kernel itself. And it'll do that um, using the security um, methods provided by eBPF. And so this is, this is honestly the preferred way that you would do this. Um, the, only, the only caveat here is you have to keep in mind that running this connection this way, it's, it's still going to um, be a read-only file system for those workloads. And so anything that needs to be able to write to disk on the underlying host, this may not be an option for, but it is the preferred method from a security perspective um, when you consider it. So um, we have another, a number of vendors that are exploring capabilities in this way. Uh, I'll use Tigera Calico as, as an example. Um, we recently did a really good blog post with them where we uh, showed how to use ePPF to accelerate the networking in Bottle Rocket so that we're using the kernel for routing using ePPF versus uh, the networking stack per se. And so what we can do is actually limit the, the need for things like cube proxy and actually use the kernel to accelerate um, packet filtering and, and even routing of the, the packets to underlying containers on that host, um, all using um, eBPF in, in a way that is very easy to set up and straightforward and secure. And so there's lots of opportunities for you to very, very powerful um, integrations with the underlying OS, but in a way that is, is still respecting essentially the security of the underlying OS itself. Um, and let me look through some of these questions because I know there's a few that have been sitting here for a while. Uh, so is the IP address of the container visible from other OS environments outside for integration or by permission from package managers only? And so the idea is if you have a repo that you want to expose, um, you can expose it to just those particular hosts and you can set up a specific network path. The, the point is, um, we want to make sure that if the host needs to be able to um, reach that repository, it has to be able to communicate from there. So whether that be you know the way we're running it for the variants we manage, where there's an S3 bucket with a CloudFront distribution, um, or you just have a private bucket, um, we want to make sure that at least um, you're storing it in a place that those hosts can actually reach it. Um, and it can be private to just those hosts. So it doesn't need to be exposed to the world. Um, unless that's the point of the variant that you're making. So imagine if you wanted to build a variant for say GCP or Azure, um, you would probably want to expose that repository in a way that we've done it for, um, for AWS um, so that it can do that. Um, so that those hosts can actually reach it. Um, and so that's kind of the goal there. Um, are these generated, uh, generated images, uh, standard ISO images that could be installed on a host offline? Um, I don't have a really good answer for this. I believe we're using OVF format or VMDK format for the, 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 the disk image. Um, so um, that's one of those ones that I will probably um, have to ask the team to, to get a little bit more clarity on what that process should look like. At the end of the, the, the presentation, I've got my Twitter handle. And so if there's a question along these lines that um, I, can't I can't quite answer on the, the, the call, by all means, hit me up on Twitter and the team and I will be happy to, to follow up with, with additional answers and, and, and conversation. Um, so that one I will have to get back to you on. So please feel free to hit me up at Boring Geek and on Twitter. Um, when running Bottle Rocket OS on EC2 in order to start the admin container for troubleshooting, 
we connect to the EC2 instance via SSM. Is there a way to start the admin container when running Bottle Rocket out, uh, OS outside AWS and without access to SSM? So yes, essentially you can you can activate it two ways. So you can activate it via the control container using the API itself, or you can use user data. So when that host is actually spun up, the user data will actually specify whether or not um, the admin container can be activated. And so you don't necessarily need to activate it outside of AWS, but you can activate it as part of the provisioning scripts and, and the user data for the host itself. Um, and so it's, there's, there's kind of two ways to do that. Um, so that's, that's one method. Regarding eBPF, are the kernel headers included in Bottle Rocket or the, the kernel compiled with K, uh, K headers? Um, I don't have the answer to this one, honestly. Um, I believe the headers are included, um, but I will validate that. So Tador, if you want to hit me up at Boring Geek on Twitter, um, I can validate that. Pardon me, I can validate that for you. And in fact, you know, I'm just gonna switch this over to the Q&A slide because we might as well just start diving into to Q&A. We've got about seven minutes left. Um, is there a timeline for allowing Bottle Rocket via managed node groups or a timeline for GPU support? I don't have a public timeline for GPU support um, and I, I I know managed node groups is on target. Um, so it is one of the goals that we want to, to, to have out there. Um, and so it's it's something you can do today as well. Um, so it's, I, I wanna be very clear. It's like you can, in, in a managed node group, you can actually specify a custom AMI. And so you can specify the Bottle Rocket AMI and there's some config for that. Um, if you hit me up on Twitter, I can actually share um, our former um, uh, evangelist actually has a, a GitHub project that shows how to do this. Um, but you can basically specify um, a custom EMI for Bottle Rocket that will leverage the, the same variant for say EKS and will actually spin it up in a managed node group. We are working to make that much more streamlined and just native. It'll be part of the dropdown essentially um, via managed node groups. That's, that's kind of the goal. Um, I don't have a timeline that I can share for that, unfortunately, but it is a, a, a it is a very requested feature and it's something that we want to make sure happens. Um, and then as far as GPU support, I don't have a timeline for that, but if you want to get a part of this, oh, and actually Ben on the, the call is, is responding. So uh, Ben is one of our, our engineers, our principal engineer on the project. Um, and so if you want a specific feature, or you need a specific capability, this is an open source project. And so I wanna make sure that you all understand, like if you want to participate, if you wanna submit issues, if you wanna submit feature requests or even pull requests, you can actually go directly to the project page at github.com slash bottle rocket OS and start to participate. You can plus one features. Um, so if you need GPU support, definitely go in and, and, and plus one that feature request. Um, ben has been very clear regarding kernel headers. The kernel is compiled with K headers and we also make the kernel developed files available under slash user slash source slash kernels uh, for the K mod use case. So that should be there. Um, I'll be the, why not this other tool guy? <laughs> why did you make your own build system instead of using an available one like Yocto, for example? A lot of the caching and RPM packaging is done there. Um, I don't have the, the history on that one, Carlos, unfortunately. Um, I know that, that we made selections around cargo and rust uh, because of uh, just the, the language support and the kind of the security first capabilities of rust. Um, and so I, I, I think from a simplicity standpoint, that's why they went with it. So everything was essentially in these, these um, make files and TOML files. And then by using cargo, we could wire together all these disparate other capabilities together um, pretty cleanly um, in a way that worked pretty well. Uh, but we are open to suggestions. And so if there's um, a better way of doing things, by all means, definitely come reach out to through the project. And um, you know, if you want to submit a pull request and, and offer suggestions, like we would welcome participation uh, gladly. Um, in fact, we've got a number of, of, of companies that are actually working with us directly on Bottle Rocket uh, and building support for Bottle Rocket. So we have a number of uh, technology partners that are going through today. Um, and are, are, are providing features and capability that most people are leveraging today um, or need. Um, and so if you want to extend this capability, I'm going to go back over to this slide again. If you want to extend the capability and participate, by all means, we welcome you in. Um, like I said at the beginning of the call, we want to create additional variants 
uh, to support additional workloads and, and uh, orchestrators and, and even uh, cloud environments. That is the long-term goal. We want to make it so that Bottle Rocket is an OS that you can run for all your container workloads um, wherever they are. Um, and so if you want to help participate in that, by all means, we, we would love to, to have you be a part of that. Um, and if you want to get started with Bottle Rocket, um, you can go directly to the, the Bottle Rocket uh, project page um, and start getting, uh, getting your hands dirty with it today. So um, with that, are there any other questions, um, any last minute thoughts that, that any of you have? Uh, we've got about two more minutes left before uh, we've, got to, we've got to call it. Um, so we got one that just came in. So Bottle Rocket OS would never be a full-blown OS. Well, technically it is a full-blown OS. So we, we should be very clear on that. So Bottle Rocket OS is a purpose-built OS. Um, and so it is a full Linux distribution. It, it comes with all the, the, the necessary components and binaries and libraries you would need to run your containerized workloads. The difference is it's not written in the same way as a general purpose OS, where if you consider a general purpose OS, um, it includes you know, everything that you would need to run basically any workload. You, know, you can compile and build whatever workload you, yeah, for, for whatever workload you needed. Um, the point of Bottle Rocket OS is really to kind of tighten up that security, really minimize the footprint, and, and make it so it's focused on just running the containerized workloads um, for, that, for that specific purpose. If you wanted to make it a desktop OS, there's, uh, I, I would imagine, a certain degree of work that you would have to do because you would have to um, build in a support for you know, something like uh, GNOME or you know, a desktop environment. Um, and I, I would imagine a lot of that would require additional binaries and libraries that we've actually removed from the system. So um, it's not something that I would necessarily recommend for that kind of purpose. Like uh, for a desktop environment, typically you would want something that's more general purpose. Um, are kernel versions hard-coded or can they be chosen on the variants? Um, and so uh, when you saw my example of the code um, come up earlier, Carlos, um, regarding the um, EKS variant that we built, we had a very specific version of Kubernetes and the specific kernel version in that particular variant. And so if you wanted to build a variant that had a different kernel version, it would just be a matter of specifying how that, that, that would be built into that particular variant. Um, and then you would have to go through any dependency management that would um, be required for that specific kernel. Um, but it is possible to go through and do that. And if you think about how we've built um, the Kubernetes variants and even the ECS variants so far, as we've evolved uh, and upgraded the kernel, we've done that um, as part of that variant uh, along the way. So it, it has support for, for the ability to specify that version. It's just you're going to have to build that into your specific variant. Um, and there's, you know, like I said, there's examples in the, the code repository of these variants and those, uh, those uh, make files. And so you can go through and see how that, that, that process is built um, if you want to dive into it a little bit more deeper. Um, can you post your LinkedIn and Twitter ID um, to get more updates on Bottle Rocket? So um, I don't have my LinkedIn, um, but it's slash Curtis Reese. Um, my Twitter handle is at Boring Geek. Um, our project page is at github.com slash Bottle Rocket OS. Um, if you do want to participate and get more, more feedback or uh, more information, by all means, hit me up. Uh, the team and I are very happy to, to get anybody engaged and answer questions. Um, so feel free to hit me up whenever you want. And um, I think with that, we're actually at time. All right, thank you so much to Curtis for his time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. And we hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>